Michael in Miami. How are you, Sammy? Michael in Miami. Your phone sounds a little different. That's because I'm sick as a dog, but I wanted to at least give you a call. <laughs> oh, wow. You, you, you sound a little bit sick. What's going on? Uh, that, that would be a little bit true. And uh, by the time we uh, rendezvous next month in Nevada, hopefully, uh-huh. this will all be a thing of the past. Also, also had Achilles tendon surgery, which didn't help out either. So it's been a fun couple of months. Oh, that does sure. sound fun. What's on your mind today? Yeah. Well, a couple of things. By the way, after listening to the prior calls, especially uh, the political theorist, I always feel somewhat inadequate when I call over here because I'm more, you know, uh, I'm a bird's eye view kind of guy. So you guys are getting into the, to the, you know, the nilly, the nilly willy of the stuff. And it's, it's always it's one of my favorite shows. I mean, you guys bring out stuff that you always – a lot of people don't take time to look at. So I'm always appreciative. I don't always agree, you know, that we've been friends for years, or at least telephone friends for years, but it's always fun to see, you know, how things are working. And, you know, that's important. And nuts and bolts, how this stuff gets to where it is and the policies that you guys cover, very important. So kudos, brother. Um, quote, real quick, uh, two things. One, Rudy is totally broke, and those poor ladies in Georgia will probably never see a dime of the money they are justifiably entitled to. Yeah, uh, and I should just say, though, I mean, I, w- I should just say, people want to know what that number is to donate to Rudy Giuliani. And if you want to call, the number is 1 800 BAG or 224 4919. That's 1 800 BAG 4919. Uh, there you go. Well, we could make them bag man, bag guy. It could be any number of bags. Oh, or uh, the other way of doing bags. it is one eight hundred a. Really good. If you if you if you dial one eight hundred a big double X. Uh, is that it? Yeah. That no, work. that can't be it. That That's work. missing one. Somebody screwed up there. All right, go ahead. Well, the one is the screw up because there's no letter affiliated with the number one. That's the problem. Oh so yeah. Okay. Like. It's yep. like when you play Scrabble and it's like a wild card. You got to make anything you want. Yeah. But look, um, you know, I, I think that unfortunately, as, as a lot of people have sued Trump in the past, although he basically delays and delays and delays, but the judgments usually come in the form of a tenth of what it's worth. In Rudy's case, he does have some a sta- um, sustainable assets. I guess he's going to have to sell his brownstone in New York and some other stuff in order to pay it off. But who the hell cares? If you read this, I know a lot of people have. If you read the actual body of the indictment of what they did to these women and how they how this crazy preacher went down there to personally try to convince one of the ladies to con to you know to essentially repent and see her sins. It's just disgusting. It's disgusting from a religion point of view. It's disgusting from a, a human point of view. It's just they get everything they deserve. Everything. You know, Rudy's only the tip of the spear, but yep. my God, to, to just to, to go down that rabbit hole and to think that not only the guy lost, he hates losing. He associates losing with being a loser. So he basically turns everybody in the country upside down to satisfy his psychosis. That's basically what happened. Yep. You know, and he convinced enough people and friends of mine who went to, and they were down there in January 6th. They're no longer friends. I've lost touch with them. But, you know, people have essentially just kind of bought into this stuff based on this guy's, you know, one man personal vendetta. Yep. It's yep. sad. It's beyond sad. And, and unfortunately, these ladies in Georgia got caught in the in the backwash of this mess to the point where they had no business being. Who cares about poll workers, Sam? Think about it. I know. How many it. times have you gone to to a poll? Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, uh, I I agree. And uh, and you know the the fact is they're going to have trouble finding poll workers in a lot of these places around the country because of this very stuff. Exactly. Exactly. One last thing before you go. Uh, you were we were right about um, life down here in DeSantis Stan. I told you that he was I remember having this conversation with you and maybe with Emma or maybe with another colleague. I told you he was a guy who hit double A pitching down here. And, he, and once he got exposed to the big leagues, he would not survive. Yeah. And I think that's more or less been proven true. It, it you know, is. People look at Florida. It oh, is. Sorry, the you know, the real question is what happens if um, if, you know, Trump, for whatever reason, uh, you know, ha- has to go. Away. It goes away in some fashion. So we don't know. Well, I don't think he's going to be the nominee. No, I, and that won't be because of electoral reasons. I think it'll be for other reasons. Could be health. Could be he's in jail. Could be the 14th Amendment is utilized against him. 
And if that's the case, and all bets are off, I don't know who's going to show up. And the problem with DeSantis is he's he's not a likable person. Right, uh, DeSantis mean, will be bad. Politics. But the real problem is this: is that I don't think the Republican Party can do anything that would, in any way, participate in Trump not being the nominee. Because if they do, they will so virulently piss off 30% of their uh, base that they should have a very, very serious concern that they would lose the House and the Senate in a massive way. I think even if they think that Donald Trump is going to lose, I think they've got to keep him on the ballot or uh, their hopes of regaining the Senate and maintaining the House are out the window. So, you know, the only thing that's going to keep Donald Trump. I don't think it's going to be their decision. I might be his. I know people think this is an anathema. And maybe you and I can make one of our friendly, you know, dollar bets. But I think it's going to be his decision down the road. I don't think he's going to have a choice. He's going to have to pull himself out of there. He's going to have four criminal trials going at the same time. Uh, I think, listen, I think I think Donald Trump has one defense strategy, it seems to me, with these with these trials. It's the same with all of them. And that is be president. Right. Win and pardon myself. Exactly. And I know that he's not capable of doing that from a state uh, in a state thing, although he's going to try and remand it to uh, in Georgia. He's going to try and remand it to federal court. Um, Yeah. And um, so I, I, I don't. I, I think his I think that's his strategy. So I don't think he takes himself off the ballot because that is that increases his chance of going to jail, it seems to me. But he's not going to want to do it. He's going to have to do it. I think what's going to happen here and, and don't take your eyes off this 14th Amendment argument, because there's a lot of legal firepower and a certain amount of, of momentum. But who, who, who is going to who, who, who's going to facilitate that, Mike? And, What's that? Who's, who is going to facilitate that? Well, it's going to have to take be, be taken up in the cause. Someone's going to object to him being, it's going to have to be in the form of a lawsuit, like a Mark Elias or somebody's going to step up and say, you can't do this. And they'll be joined with friends of the court by some, you know, conservative never Trumpers. Right. Your friend Mona and and, and, and you're telling me the Supreme and, Court is going to rule that uh, Donald Trump can't be uh, serve as president? You know, it's funny. I don't think the Supreme Court cares too much about Donald Trump at this point. I think last fall proved that even when push came to shove, except for Thomas and Alito, he doesn't have votes you can count on with those people. But, that, but, that, but that's him, not the question. I'm, they, that's they, not the question I'm asking. That's not the question I'm asking. Do you sorry, think guys. that the uh, is not whether they care about Donald Trump? Do you think the Supreme Court is going to take the risk of intervening and, in the, in the, you know, it's not inconceivable to me they would do that if, you know, Bernie Sanders were the nominee. But uh, it's, you have to, the idea of the Supreme Court stepping in and pulling a candidate off of the, um, off of the ballot. And like, when would you do that? Because you can't, he's, well, first of all, you can't. first of all, I, I, I just, I just think the 14th Amendment thing, it's just not going to happen because he's not even charged with insurrection. So, like, how no, would you, you certainly it, it, but the standard for the suit is not the same as the standard for criminal court? Well, I understand. I understand. I All understand. All you have to do is but, prove by a preponderance of the evidence that you are, in fact, guilty of this crime, guilty of this transgression. It won't be criminal court. But to answer your question, it would work something like this. You would file a suit. Let's, let's assume for the sake of argument that uh, the, the trial in March and see, I, this is the thing that's going to be a wild card. Which one of these trials is going to come to a conclusion first? I think the Jack Smith trial is not going to go six months. He narrowly tailored those okay, arguments. Okay, put that aside, though. Well, let's just stay with the 14th people. Amendment. Just stay with the 14th Amendment. Right, the, I'm getting there. I am. The, the issue is going to be this. There will be some type of, of verdict some type of, of, denom- of, of nominal determination of his guilt in one of those cases. And that will trigger the need to file the suit for the 14th Amendment. That's going to be the actual launch point. And I, that's just, look, like I said, it's a minority view. It doesn't have a whole lot of, of, of support at this point in terms of the overall media landscape. I understand that. But the way these things, you've seen this before. 
circumstances outside the candidate's control conspire to create this tsunami of pressure, which eventually force him or her to do something that they don't really want to do, whether it's Gary Hart, whether it's anything else. These things kind of overtake you. You don't have control of the narrative anymore. Hell, he doesn't have control of the narrative now. Fox News has abandoned him. He can hang out at OAN and, and right-wing media, but that, that's a shrinking island. That's not going anywhere. He does not have the broad-based support that he did even two years ago. Yeah, I, crazies, I agree with all that. And the crazies are violent. I agree with all that, but I don't think that um, – I, I don't think uh... – I don't. I, I just don't think that his. Well, let me let me put this scenario in front of you. He's thinking that let way. This. Let's assume, for the sake of argument, as they say in my business, that he's convicted by June of 2024. That the Smith trial goes three months. Now they're saying it's going to go two years. That's bullshit. It's not going to happen. He's going to appeal that decision. Okay, fine. He appeals the decision, and that appeal may be fast tracked. It might not be. But in the meantime, you're going to have more than a couple of people who are moneyed interest in the Republican Party, not interested in tethering themselves to a sinking stone, which is exactly what he'll be at that point, because he'll be a convicted former twice impeached president. And you don't think there's going to be people who are going to quietly and maybe not so quietly settle up to the idea of we got to get this guy out of here. Oh, if for no other I, reason I, I, that they don't want to lose the House. Oh, no, no. I think you lose the House if he's off the ballot more than you lose it if he's on the ballot. Well, if you're Brian Kemp, you would say no, because Brian Kemp looked him in the teeth and won that race. No, no, no. Brian Kemp, Brian Kemp looked him in the teeth and won that mm-hmm. race. But um, that's not he's running in, in the entire state of a purple state of, uh, of Georgia. But if you are um, in a, you know, a, uh, 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 you know, and people had a reason to come out and vote, people aren't coming out to vote. For uh, you know these house races, these purple house races are not coming out to vote uh, if they uh, are disaffected, uh, disaffected Trump voters. I mean, sometimes yes. In my state, for instance, yeah, what do you think is going to happen you put, if you, know, you if the Republican the Party is matter. responsible? Let me ask you this: If you think the yeah. Republican Party is responsible for kicking Donald Trump off the ballot, and you are one of that thirty percent of the country that is like will literally uh you know throw themselves in a bu- in front of a bus for donald trump well you think you're gonna come out and vote for uh the republican senate uh candidate in wisconsin or in uh pennsylvania or in uh, like arizona like you arizona. You're come out and vote for carrie arizona. lake you're gonna come out and, and yeah. no i don't think so no i don't think so either but i think remember the narratives can change on the dime i mean we were talking where are we september of 2023 Nine months from now, which is an eternity, plus 10, you can have a number of different things well, happen between yeah, we'll now see. and June 30th we'll of next see. year. Okay? Yeah. Just, no, I know that. I know that, too. But and he may right, not Mike, we got to go. It. And, and don't forget, my state, and this is a fascinating case study at some point, I've lived in two states for the majority of my life, Michigan and, well, Maryland, too, but Michigan and Florida. And if you look at what's happened in the last 28 months between those two states, the migration changes, the political changes. Yep. It doesn't matter who's on top of the ticket. What's happened is a demographic shifts. All I told you guys this before. All those racists who lived in New Jersey and New York and Maryland and Pennsylvania and Michigan and Ohio, they all moved where? Where Florida. did they go? They all moved down hey, to Florida. Raising my hand. Yeah. No, yeah, but yeah. raising my hand, pal. Well, I appreciate it. Here. Mike, I gotta go. I gotta go. But I appreciate it. I'll I'll talk to you soon. All right, Take bye-bye. care. Bye. Uh, that ends the call-in portion of the program. Uh, Majority Report wardrobe coordinator. I wish Republicans would try and throw Trump off the ballot or do a broken convention. The whole base would stay home. I totally agree. Honestly, I think like it is in the Republicans' best interest to uh, even leave him, even if he's in prison, leave him on the top of the ticket because otherwise um, they will lose five, ten percent, or whatever. Um, Phineas Ferb, we're going to pretend Joe Biden looks healthy and Trump can't beat him until he does. No lessons learned. Well, first off, I will say this. There are never the, those type of lessons are never, ever learned. With the real no lessons learned is people who expect a, um, a political party to learn a lesson like that. There's not a single example of a political party ever learning a lesson like that. I made this argument back in 2016 in the run-up to the election. There's not going to be a lesson learned if people stay home and don't vote for Hillary Clinton. The the party's not going to go like, 
oh my gosh, we should move to the left. I said specifically, I didn't think it would be Joe Biden because I just didn't think that he was that, uh, I just thought he was just, wouldn't even get elected. But I was like, I saw what have to, happened after George Bush, a guy that, you know, people thought should be impeached. Uh, Barack Obama was sort of like, almost like a shock. And he wasn't some type of radical. I saw what happened after um, uh, Ronald Reagan. We got Bill Clinton. I, I, it was the, anybody who thinks that there's going to be a lesson learned by this has not learned their own lesson, which is no, <laughs> a sitting president, unless they give up their, uh, um, unless they give up their, their seat, it's incredibly hard to challenge them. And nobody stood up and, and challenged them. I, I, I think it's a problem that uh, uh, Joe Biden is uh, uh, that age. If Joe Biden was 15 years younger, it wouldn't be a, a doubt in anybody's mind. But who's going to come up and, and who's going to convince him to get off? We can't even get the Dianne Feinstein out of the Senate. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a problem. But the idea that, you know, someone's going to learn some type of lesson. No, the lesson is the real lesson is if you have a right wing presidency. The vast majority of Democrats. And the vast majority of the country is going to sort of take a flight to safety, which is going to be someone who is uh, like Joe Biden. Do I worry about Joe Biden's age? Yes. But you also see, I think, an analog with that in the in some of these Senate races. Like, I mean, we'll see, obviously, what happens. But even in some polling um, in the early going in the Montana primary, Matt Rosendale, like the Freedom Caucus guy, um, is already putting his hat in the ring against the NRSC endorsed Tim Sheehy and he's leading him already by like 20 points. He lost to John Tester the last time he ran against him. And then we also in Arizona will potentially have a, you know, potentially caustic primary between Blake Masters and Carrie Lake, even before we get to the cinema Gallego aspect of it. Like some of these races, I think will also be affected by the same sort of aspect, which is just the, galvanizing effect of not wanting a freak in office well i mean here's the th the the only value in terms of if you want to uh, maintain the senate uh the, the democrats the same uh, maintain the senate the only value of a carrie lake blake masters matchup or of uh the masterson and the uh, other one in um in montana uh, in, in montana yeah is not that they're going to weaken each other it is that they're going to force each other to become even more right. bat crap crazy to get out of the to primary. win right. that primary. So as crazy as Blake Masterson is and as crazy as Carrie Lake is, they're going to have to become crazier right. to get through their primary. And then they're going to have to cut back and attempt in the general. to win yeah. in the general right. and the same thing in Montana. The same dynamic in Montana. You don't win a Republican primary by seeming like the most reasonable person. <laughs> and then you've got to go into the general and you're in big trouble. And that's the value of having their primary. Not that like they're going to be they're going to be weakened only because they went they went to the bleeding because edge they're going win. more to the right.